Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. When it comes to AMD's FSR technology, overall, it's been received fairly favorably. And there is something delightful about being able to run FSR on, let's say, a GTX 1080. It's kind of one of those things that just feels a little bit better than possibly it should. But let's face it, this technology is going to continue to evolve. And a patent has actually resurfaced that I covered earlier this year. Now, the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is, first of all, a number of people are asking me to cover this patent. So I just want to let you guys know that I have covered it. I will go into the basics in just a moment. But it also sets me up to discuss something I've been hearing about RDNA3 from a couple of different people. So regarding the pattern, I'll link a video where I've gone into it much more extensively. But basically, it discusses MLA, or Machine Learning Accelerator Chiplets. These are basically NVIDIA's tensor cores, although it's important to know that tensor cores are not necessarily NVIDIA's invention. But basically, they work much like NVIDIA's tensor cores, and they are in a chiplet form. So you can stack multiple of these together along with other GPU components, such as, well, you know, GPU cores like compute units, and obviously memory and other bits and bobs to create different um, GPUs to work in different scenarios, for example, gaming or uh, something in the data center, or possibly even a laptop, which is really good for professionals like data scientists, that type of thing. It's actually really cool stuff. What we do know, of course, of RDNA3 almost certainly is that it is chiplet based. Well, more accurately, Narve 31 and 32 are chiplet based, but Narve 33, I believe, is monolithic and I assume Narve 34 is as well. And this is why I do not believe this patent is actually for RDNA 3. Um, because a lot of speculation at the moment is that it is for RDNA 3, and I'm not 100% convinced. Now, my personal guess is that it's either for RDNA 4 or just as possibly a data center focused GPU or something else initially. I wouldn't be surprised though if it does come to graphics later on. So my personal gut feeling, at least at this stage, is that RDNA3 does not have MLA. Now it is possible I am wrong, but I've only been really told about two types of chiplets. These are the GCDs, which basically house things like compute units, and the other one is uh, MCD, which originally I thought was mostly just an IO die, but it also seems to uh, house a ton of cache, which is basically the Infinity Fabric. The TLDR here is that it's going to be a really interesting GPU, and I'm hearing that the performance, of course, of Narve 31 and other SKUs is going to be absolutely just ridiculous. It's going to just, it's going to be really good. Um, but moving on to the main point of this video, a couple of things I've been hearing recently is FSR was almost considered like, I don't know, kind of like DLSS 1. It was important for AMD to get it out, and it's also been a really good PR win outside of well, the tech of upsampling and, you know, how good or bad it looks, you know, I'll leave that down to your discussion and, um, you know, your, your, <laughs> your assessment, but it has been a major PR win for AMD. I can argue that they kind of dropped the ball at a couple of points. I think that their marketing could have been a little bit stronger around it. And I do wish that they had a few more titles with FSR available at the product's launch. A really strong candidate for this, and an obvious one, would have been something like Resident Evil Village. But either way, in general, FSR has been received very well. However, it does not take into account certain things, for example, motion, which is something that NVIDIA's DLSS solution does actually have a strength in. But... Yeah, there are definitely some drawbacks to DLSS as well, and it is most certainly more difficult to implement for games developers. And it also means that the code has to be trained on NVIDIA servers, which is a huge cost outlay. Like, just think of how much work that is for NVIDIA to maintain. It's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of effort. Um, and also, it means that you have to then get that code from NVIDIA servers to your local system. Now, of course, there are a couple of ways you can do that. The first is a brute force approach. You can just basically stuff all of the code for all of the games which have got DLSS into the drivers, done. So you download it, and obviously this does mean that drivers will continue to balloon. So a driver in 2021 might be 800 megabytes, for example, and then in like 2023, it could be like, I don't know, a gig or 1.2 gigs, who the hell knows? That's not necessarily a super big deal, but it is kind of annoying. Another smarter option is, <laughs> Well, I guess it's kind of smart delivery. If you have control in your Steam library, it will download the DLSS kind of 
code for it and then obviously if you download another game it will continue you know and obviously if you uninstall the game it will kind of clean it from the drivers and so on and it wouldn't exactly be um you know unheard of for a company to kind of use that as its model but what i am hearing is that amd is not planning to do quite this for its upsampling technology i'm gonna for the rest of this video call it fsr2 but i don't know if that is going to be the final name for it the only reason I'm calling it FSR2 is because we already have FSR 1.0, is AMD are referring it. I also cannot keep calling it like AMD upsampling or reconstruction or whatever because it's possible I will go insane. Well, actually, a little more insane than what I already am, but the voices won't let me kind of, you know, go through that with you all. Anyway, so from my understanding, basically the code uh, from AMD side is going to work a little bit differently. Instead of being trained by NVIDIA, or in this case AMD, it basically is trained on your local machine. And obviously this does mean some kind of difficulties at the start, but it basically will take multiple samples depending on the game, the resolution that you're playing, obviously. And there are other factors too. For example, if you're upsampling, let's say from a high resolution, let's say you're playing a 1440p and you want to upsample to 4k obviously you've got a lot more detail to work with than let's say if you're 1080p to 4k which is like a four times increase in pixel or yeah just god help you if you're doing 720p to 4k now obviously this does mean a lot of drawbacks and honestly i don't know the answer to a lot of the questions inevitably we'll have with this like how will it work how long will the training take honestly i don't know now i honestly do not know if this is true i'm not as solid about this as for example the chiplet information of RDNA or several other things that I've leaked in the past. However, it is quite interesting to me because while I received an email about this, it wasn't too long afterwards, someone else was telling me a very similar thing. Now, this does not necessarily mean one is true because it could simply be that a rumor or someone has kind of revealed it to one person and then that same rumor has gone to someone else i honestly don't know but i am finding it quite interesting so i'm just going to put it out there and it's a discussion point if nothing else also while we're talking about fsr another very interesting thing is that developers have actually confirmed that the playstation 5 can run fsr as well i'll leave a link to the interview with wcc Tech in the video description I won't go too much into the interview because quite frankly, a lot of it is kind of detailing things we kind of already knew about the differences, for example, of DLSS and FSR, but there are some fascinating nuggets, but I did want to just focus on the PS5 thing. So basically the developers have confirmed that the PS5 can run FSR. I'm sure most of you would agree that that's not really surprising. I mean, the FSR could work all the way back to what, Polaris or whatever? for AMD, so there's no way that the PS5 GPU is just not gonna do it. And this is kind of, you know, I could go on a whole tangent and a rant here, but this is kind of my issue with Sony. Like, they had a really big opportunity to just say, yep, we support this, but they just didn't. And, you know, if I guess I would actually be slightly more mad if our AMD, because it would have been really nice for Sony to have officially said, yeah, our dev kits can support this. And, you know, it would have been a nice PR win for them. Instead, Microsoft were just kind of leading the charge, which, again, is really great for both Microsoft and AMD in their publicity. And I think it's just kind of frustrating that Sony just will not discuss anything remotely regarding the PS5's uh, specifications or support. And at this point, it's like... <laughs> I'm really surprised they even admitted that the system requires power before it launched. Like, does it, does it, does it require power? Maybe uh does it does it you know does it give you mind control maybe <laughs> who knows you'll find out maybe later on right it's absolutely ridiculous and um yeah as i mentioned this before but i do believe a lot of it really comes down to how the road to ps5 um was just received and basically i think there was a lot of frustration although i think while the road to ps5 was received poorly and i do think that you know, some of it was people being somewhat disingenuous with what certainly said. In my personal opinion, Road to PS5 was this really awkward middle ground where it was being pushed to kind of, I don't know how to describe it, but kind of to break down the PS5, but you had this weirdness of where it was too technical for the majority of people. 
but it also wasn't technical or detailed enough for technical people. So it just tried to like glide by in this no man's land and we're left with these tons of answers and it, yeah, it, was, it wasn't good in my opinion. But, um, but now I do want to uh, discuss one final topic and this is Intel. Specifically, they are going to be leveraging TSMC for their free NM process. There are several reports on this already and uh, I'm just going to read it from Nakai.com. Uh, so basically, according to TSMC themselves, uh, FreeNM is a about 15% improvement in terms of performance over 5NM, but also reducing power consumption. And this is quite a key one, 25 to 30%. So Apple, as well as Intel, are the first customers which have jumped on TSMC's FreeNM process. And yeah, that's not necessarily a good sign for Intel going forward and the confidence of their own nodes. Unfortunately, what we don't have is a detailed itinerary of what Intel's silicon plans are, as in what specific SKUs they're going to be creating. Is it going to, for example, be high-end processors like servers, high-end desktops, or is it going to be mobile-focused parts? Who knows? We honestly do not have a clue. What is quite interesting, though, is that Intel seemed to be gobbling up a huge amount of volumes, huge amount of capacity from TSMC. And obviously one of the, I don't know how you describe it, I guess one of the, 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 the leading, uh, one of the leading advantages, I suppose, of AMD is undoubtedly TSMC's process. So in a way, I suppose it'll be quite interesting to see how AMD and Intel fare when their processes are identical. The only difference is, well, the architecture itself, right? The, 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 the engineering prowess which actually brought up the architecture. And I want to just say something that I've been kind of meaning to say in a couple of videos now, but I am getting a little concerned about Intel's 7NM process. Now, I won't even bring 10NM into the... I just won't even mention it because I'm pretty sure all of us are just going to have PTSD at this point. But when it comes to 7NM, there have been, you know, quite a lot more hope with it. And Pat Gelsinger has actually been quite boastful, but... Again, now a couple of people are telling me that 7NM is not in great shape. And I'm really hoping that that is not the case. Because that would suck for Intel in, you know, so many different ways. Um, and what we do know, of course, is that Intel's Pat Gelsinger has already gone on record and said that they are working strategically with TSMC in the future. But again, details are definitely very thin on the ground. And I don't think Intel are going to go fabless for all of the very obvious reasons. But they have a long-ass way to go before they are competitive um, in this. And quite honestly, you know, with Intel, it's, it's... I think most people, you know, are really at the point now where it's not that we want Intel to tell us something, it's that we want Intel to show us something. And it's really frustrating because I'm a big Intel fan, I'm a big AMD fan, I'm a big Nvidia fan, and I really want all of these companies to be as damn well competitive as possible because it's just really good for us as end users. But Intel have just been dropping the ball at the moment and I'm very hopeful for Older Lake. Hopefully Older Lake will be good. I'm, I'm really, really, really hoping Older Lake is good. Insert sad face here. And one last thing that I want to mention in this video, it's not really a news topic in and of itself that I was going to cover, but this kind of started to pop up on Twitter when Phil Park, who is an AMD employee, he works over at the memory division of uh, AMD, he actually tweeted about this and I spotted it there. And the TLDR is that Patriot Viper has basically been cutting the DRAM cache of its SSDs. And while you can see the tweet on screen yourself, so I won't read it verbatim, but I just want to say that this is just, <laughs> I don't want to swear, but this is just, this is bollocks, actually. I just, I, I just want to go ahead and say it. Because here's the thing with this, you know, they're saying that they cannot update the spec sheet. Dude, it's not that difficult. It's not that you're creating a programming language for scratch. You are not creating an entire new, you, you know what, you're not, you're not, just seriously, update the spec sheet. And what frustrates me more about this is that, you know, you're gonna, let's say you release a product and then six months later, three months later, you adjust the specs. Well, you also look, make the reviewers 
um, look like crap, but you also are just screwing over customers because the vast majority of customers are not going to get a drive and be like, herp a derp, I'm going to check the specs of the drive and check the, you know, DRAM capacity or the cache on a CPU or whatever, insert, you know, check here, because it's just not something that the majority of people are going to do. It helped, to be honest, if I were not doing this and I wasn't reviewing things, I don't think I would even think of it initially. I might notice the performance is a little lower, but it would probably take me a couple of weeks. Like, you know, most of the time you're just busy. You're like, you know what? I've got this drive. I, I need the extra space. Throw it in. Bang. I'm doing other things. So the thing is, if you have a wave of reviews, let's say the product launches, just to make it really simple and say that it launches the 1st of January. You get the reviews up the 1st of January, and then let's say April, they're like, oh, April Fools, we're changing the specs, and we're going to reduce the DRAM capacity to a quarter of what it was, oh sorry, the uh, DRAM cache to a quarter of what it was, what you're getting is the initial boost of the positive reviews. And then of course, most customers don't notice that. And I just, I don't like it. I think it's just really crap, quite frankly. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying this to bring it to your attention, because if you are thinking of picking up one of these drives, you know, just, well, basically buyers beware. And hopefully, you know, I've not really heard anything negative about the company before, about Patriot Viper. Do let me know if you guys have, but I've not really heard anything negative. And all companies are allowed to screw up. I think all companies are, because every company has. No company is 100% squeaky clean, and everyone, including myself, makes mistakes. But it's how they address this going forward, because at the moment, it's not acceptable. With that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Uh, if you have, you know what to do. Click the likey button and subscribe on YouTube. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.